Hello and welcome to another instructional video about media literacy. Today's topic is the media and the news production process. What are the learning outcomes? At the end, you will have learned about the typical editorial organization for content production, the principles of news value, ethical issues in content production, publication and broadcasting, and issues of intellectual property, otherwise known as copyright. Here we have a quotation by Walter Lippmann, one of the most important mass media theorists. He said that the function of news is to signalize an event. The function of truth is to bring to light the hidden facts, to set them in relation with each other and make a picture of reality on which men can act. This is an important quotation. Why? Because we need to make a distinction between the truth and the news. Even though journalists are bound by their professional ethics to base their production, their, their output on, um, on the truth, however, they go through uh, several filters, several processes, and the truth, as it comes out through the news, is not the same as the truth as we would have known it if we were to investigate it personally. Here we can see the evolution of the typical newspaper newsroom over the years. On the left we have the New York Times in 1942, where it is obvious that there are no computers and the main tools used were the telephone and, and the typewriter. We have the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette newsroom around 2001, when we already have the use of computers. You can see the large CRT monitors. The journalists are working on their computers rather than on their telephones. And we already see the computerization of the news production process. On the right, we see the Washington Post newsroom in 2018, which is basically an, an improvement, a development of the computer-based journalist newsroom. What are the principal roles in content and news production? Here we can see a list of the major jobs. We have the editor, the head of news, the sub-editor, the journalist, reporter or copywriter, the photographer or video camera person, the photo video editor and the web editor publisher. The editor is the person who decides what gets broadcast or published. The head of news is responsible for coordinating all the production of the news. The sub-editor, usually in a newspaper or in an online newsroom, works with the editor and decides what gets published, what are the headlines and the running order of the news. Obviously, the journalist, the reporter and the copywriter do the research and write their copy. What's the difference between the three? Usually a journalist does some research, has investigative stories. The reporter reports about happenings, what is going on there and then. Usually these are what is known as diary news, when politicians and organizations actually call the media to inform them and to brief them up. And also accidents. Copywriters are journalists who usually do not leave their desk, but do research and do uh, everything on their desk and write the news as it should be used in the broadcast and online media. The photographer and the video camera person, their role is uh, quite obvious here, but usually they do not edit their work. Their work is passed on to the photo and the video editors who, together with the journalists and the reporters, produce the news that is broadcast on television or published on a news website. The web editor and the publisher then have the responsibility to make sure that all the hard work of all the people that we have mentioned actually gets disseminated to the public. If we had to group these major jobs into three principal roles, we find that there are the roles related to research, collection of material and first production. These are the journalists, reporters, copywriters, photographers and video camera person. Then we have the editing and the polishing, one very important filter, and this is the head of news, the sub-editor and the editor, and then we have the publication and the transmission. In this infographic, we have the links between the different roles, and as you can see, it is not a linear process, 
but all the different roles are active throughout the day. When the reporter does his or her job and reports and writes his or her copy, feed it to the chief reporter who uh, coordinating the day's work, then it goes to the news editor who has a very good overview of what is going on throughout the day and throughout the newsroom. And then there is the chief sub-editor who coordinates all the sub-editing and tries to bring everything together. The check sub-editor, which is a minor role which we have not mentioned earlier, who does a second uh, checking. Then there is the proofreading, especially for newspapers and online news this is very important. However, the speed of the news today makes it difficult for proofreaders to keep up with the rapid pace. And in some instances, actually, there are no funds to have a proofreader. And then uh, the news story goes to the web editor for publication online or to printing on a newspaper. And everything is the responsibility of the editor. In terms of law, he uh, represents the news organization and if something happens, the editor has to respond for the work of his or her subordinates. Principles of news value. According to Galtung and Rouge, there are principles of news value which news organizations and journalists and reporters stick to when producing the news. This is a conceptual framework used within journalism to describe the gatekeeping practices of the mainstream news media. We have already seen in another video that journalists do gatekeeping, that is, they are filters to news. They do not publish everything, they do not cover everything because they are selective. And how does this selection take place? It takes place according to these criteria for news value. The first criterion is frequency. Events that unfold conveniently within the production cycle of a news outlet are more likely to be reported. That is, if something happens when journalists are on duty, it will be reported, but if something happens in the middle of the night or something happens in the middle of the desert where there are no journalists, most probably the coverage will be much less or there won't be any coverage. Threshold. The larger the event, the more people it affects, the more likely it is to be reported. If it is an accident and there are many people involved, it will be reported and the likelihood it is reported and given prominence is greater than if the accident only involves one person. This is quite evident when we have major events, major natural events like tsunamis, earthquakes, volcanoes erupting or uh, traffic accidents, for example, that involve multiple cars and multiple persons. Unambiguity. The fewer ways there are of interpreting an event, the more likely it is to be reported. Reporters have to cover a lot of different subjects, and they cannot be experts in all subjects. Unfortunately, in places like Malta, expertise and specialization is very difficult, and therefore most of our journalists in Malta are a sort of jack of all trades, no, no offense meant. So, if the event is quite clear to understand, uh, there is the possibility that the reporters will report it more faithfully and it will be chosen for reporting because it can be understood by the newsroom and the journalist. Meaningfulness. The more culturally proximate or relevant an event is, the more likely it is to be reported. This is an important link to the market. Here in Malta, for example, if we cover what's happening in Malta, this will be given much more prominence than something which is happening on the other side of the world. However, if the other side of the world is Australia or Canada or the United States, where there are sizable Maltese migrant communities, then culturally they become proximate to Malta and therefore it is more likely that they are covered then uh, events that happen not far away from these spots, but yet culturally they are very far away. Consonance. If a journalist has a mental pre-image of an event, 
if it's expected to happen, then it is more likely to be reported. Journalists are human beings, and like all human beings, we like to have schedules, we like to have routines, and we like to have patterns. So, if there are recurrent events, reporters are more likely to cover these events because they know what to expect, and therefore they can be prepared to cover these events and provide a better work. Unexpectedness. If an event is unexpected, it is more likely to be considered newsworthy and to be reported. This, in a way, is a contradiction of the previous principle. However, as we say, extremes meet. In this case, if the event is totally unexpected, like a natural disaster, for example, an accident, something which no one had an inkling that it was going to happen, like the September 11th attacks, for example, then this unexpectedness will alert the journalist and they will cover it better. Why? Because it is a surprise to them and it is also a surprise to their audience and therefore it solicits a lot of attention. Continuity. Once an issue has made the news, once future events related to it are more likely to be reported. This happens because it is now on the agenda of the news production media and we have seen in the other video that the media are agenda setters and therefore if they are acquainted with the nature of the reporting then it is more likely that they will continue to report on that series. Cosmopolitan balance an event that contributes to the diversity of topics reported is more likely to be covered than one that adds to a pile of similar news items. Once again, this may sound a little opposite to what we have just said. However, journalists as human beings like variety, not just routine and patterns. And therefore, if they come across a story that has new meaning, that provides something new to their audience, therefore they will be happy to cover it. Elite nations and regions. Events that involve elite nations or regions are more likely to be reported than those that do not. And we're going to see a very good example later on in this video. Obviously, the bigger and more important the country is, the more attention it will get because the more influence and the more effect it has on the lives of countries around the world. Elite people Events that involve elite people are more likely to be reported than those that do not. And the most obvious example is politicians. And here in Malta, since many of our news media is owned by the political parties, it is obvious that politics has a prominent role in news production. Personification. Events that can be discussed in terms of the actions of individual actors are more likely to be reported than those that are the outcome of abstract social forces. This is putting a face to a story. If we can put a face to a story, then the story is more lively, is more human, and therefore journalists prefer to report and to investigate people rather than ideas. By the same token, social forces are more likely to be discussed in the news if they can be illustrated by way of reference to individuals. That is why sometimes when we have statistics coming out, they are reported in a very dry manner. Why? Because statistics are not lively. But if we put a face to these statistics, if the statistics are about the population, for example, and we know the effects of population, of migration, of people living in communities, and we can put faces of people to these stories, then these stories become alive. Negativity. An event with a negative outcome is more likely to be reported than one with a positive outcome. And this is one of the biggest criticisms of news, because most of the news items in our news is negative news. The majority of news items we read or watch are negative, bad news sells, and this is the reason why we have a lot of bad news, because people want to know what things are bad and what is coming in their direction. So what is the conclusion? If the event fits a range of these news values, it becomes the news.
This is a map of the world according to the coverage of the Garden Online News in 2012. And you can clearly see that the amount of coverage that countries like the United States attract, it is bigger than its geographic size. And countries much larger, geographically speaking, attract smaller coverage. If we were to compare this map to a real map of the countries, as we can see here, we see the difference. So the criterion for news value in this case is not the population of a country, is not the geographic size of a country, but its importance and the influence in the world according to the editors of The Guardian Online. So if we were to write a new story, what should guide us? There are five W's and one H. First of all, in this new story, we need to say what. What are we talking about? Where? Where is the story happening? When? We need to give it a timestamp. Who? Who was involved? This is very important because the news has to be about people. Why? The people need to know why all this has happened. And how? How this has happened. Give the details of how the story has unfolded. Let's take a local news story from the Times of Malta.com as an example. This is a traffic accident. This has all the ingredients of a good news story because it satisfies a lot of, um, of the principles that we have just mentioned. The most important details are at the top of the story. First of all, we start with who. Seven people, including four children. So we have children involved, and usually uh, we feel compassion for children. And therefore, saying that four children are involved, this is major news. What happened? These were taken to hospital following a head-on collision. So this is not a small uh, traffic accident, but a major one. When? This happened on Sunday afternoon. Where? On the Marsa Hamroon bypass. Let's not forget, this is a brand new road. This has been resurfaced and has been changed over the past few weeks to accommodate more cars and make traffic less of a problem. Do I? The accident happened because of a head-on collision. And how? We have a description of how the cars collided. In the rest of the new story, we have further details. What about ethical issues and sources? Because journalists need to get data, need to get information. And usually this information is not publicly available. According to C.P. Scott, a British newspaper owner and editor, comment is free, but facts are sacred. It is well to be frank, it is even better to be fair. So here we have two very important principles. Comment is free. Everyone is free to put his or her opinion across. However, facts are sacred. We cannot twist or tinker with facts. We can have different interpretation of facts, but facts are the same or should be the same for everyone. The second principle, it is well to be frank. We can give a frank opinion. However, it is even better to be fair. The need of fairness in journalism. And fairness means that we need to give equal opportunity to all the different opinions to be aired. Copyright and fair use. In relation to journalism, copyright means that the creator of a work, in this case usually written, visual or spoken, has exclusive rights to its use, distribution, in order to profit from it. Journalists rely on the fair use doctrine to let them use any type of work that is copyrighted in limited circumstances, without obtaining permission of the owner or paying for its use. This means that to carry out their journalistic work, sometimes a journalist has to use copyrighted material. But with the fair use principle, a journalist can copy a part 
of other people's work for a journalist's work. Let's take a very simple example. If a journalist is um, writing a story about an actor that has died, the journalist can take excerpts of movies in which the uh, actor has acted in the past and use them as a video for his television production. That is called fair use. The purpose of fair use is to offset the rights of the author for recompense with the rights of the public for the wide distribution of information and opinion. According to American federal law, the fair use of a copyrighted work for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, including multiple copies for classroom use, scholarship or research, is not an infringement of copyright. So according to American law, journalists and educators can uh, not infringe, but can bend a little bit the copyright laws because what they are doing is in the public interest or for education. However, if we want to be on the safe side, we can use materials that are covered by Creative Commons. Creative Commons is a new way of licensing your work that is taking the place of the old copyright legislation. With Creative Commons, the owner of a work can give permission at different levels to a user to copy and reuse his or her material. And here we have a link to the Creative Commons website where you can find more information. And if you want to search for material that is under Creative Commons licensing, you can go to the search engine of the creativecommons.org website or use the inbuilt search facility for usage rights content from Google search. Let's go back to news writing. A good title and headline completes a good report. The title or a headline is very important. So how should we write the headline of a news item, of an article? First of all, we have to take the Q from the five W's and the H because in themselves, these contain the most important facts of the story. We also need to be factual in the title and make sure that what is in the title reflects what is in the new story. We need to use strong verbs in the active voice and be specific and not approximative. We need to make the headline lively. And also remember that most people will continue reading, watching if they are attracted by the headline. So the headline should be an invitation to read, listen, and watch further on. Here we have some very interesting newspaper headlines from a long time ago. One of the most uh, famous headlines was Titanic sinking, no lives lost. Obviously, the, the newspaper got it all wrong because uh, hundreds of people lost their lives in the sinking of the Titanic. However, the new story was not covered adequately by new newspaper because at the time the communications were not so efficient as they are today. This is the Times of Malta reporting on Malta becoming an independent nation state. We also have the New York Times uh, reporting on the 9-11 attacks. A more recent headline, Tutte pardonne, that is the first Charlie Hebdo edition that uh, was published after the terrorist attacks on the Charlie Hebdo newsroom. On a more humorous note, let's look at these. Explosives of air. Obviously, a gas heater can explode. Caravaggio, inspiration, beautifully executed. I don't know, but those who did the marketing campaign may not have been aware that actually Caravaggio did the painting of the beheading of St. John the Baptist, and therefore St. John the Baptist was executed. Amaretto mouses with chocolate sauce. No, thank you. Should have been mouses, not mouses. Diana was still alive hours before she died. I think that was quite obvious. That is a very lousy headline. Deaths are coming. That is an issue of news production. That means that the information that was going to be published in that segment, in that column about the deaths of people, 
had not been uh, released was not received in time before the newspaper went to printing. One armed man applauds the kindness of strangers. Journalists need to be very careful about the human element, and obviously a one armed man cannot applaud. Show her the real you. Unfortunately, here we have a problem with the sub-editing, because the way the pictures were put on the page of the newspaper, the women in the pictures are all looking in the direction of the advert, and the advert is about the underwear we can see over there. So, to conclude, news can be seen as a selective version of world events, with a focus on that which is news and or unusual, and we've seen the criteria. However, not all news is new, much of it is predictable, and some does not concern events at all. Journalists identify, select and produce news items according to occupational norms, including the concept of what will interest a particular target audience. We have seen the principles of news value. Implicitly or explicitly, journalists measure potential news items against a range of criteria that have become known as news values. Academics have produced lists of such news values based on studies of journalistic output. Other theoretical models associated with the study of news include news as a social construct, journalists as gatekeepers admitting or excluding events, and the news values being imbued with the dominant ideology of society. It has been claimed that the development of user-generated content and social media may be undermining the traditional role of the journalist as gatekeeper, blaring the boundary between producer and audience, and altering, to an extent, considerations of what is considered newsworthy. And this last sentence, the topic of user-generated content and the difference between producer and user, is a very important development in journalism and will be tackled in a different video.